On today's Movie Talk, we've got your weekend box office analysis. Also, look, it's a brand new trailer for Top Gun Maverick. And oh my, I'm losing my mind. The Power Rangers are coming back to the big screen. We're going to get into it. Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. I am Perry Nemroff. I'm your host of Movie Talk, and I'm sitting at this table today with Haley Fouch and John Roca. What's up? Hello. How you doing? Good. Good. Happy Good. Monday. Happy Monday. Hey, Roca, who's hosting the show tomorrow? I guess I'm hosting the show tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Because now the calendar says, the calendar says Perry Coy and RB3. There's no way. It There's does. no way. It says it. But no, we're, we're yeah. here to talk about Top Gun. Oh, I can't boy. wait. Let's get it on. But first, I know there's other things first. If only you knew how excited Roca was when he realized we were talking about that to run off the set, get his Woo. glasses, and come right back. <laughs> Haley, how's life? Everything good? good? Yeah. yeah. We got a big night planned. We do. I'm very excited. I am as well. I'm excited to party with you. Yes. <laughs> on a Monday night. <laughs> yes. Monday. That's what you're keep supposed together, to do. Keep it together. It's the end of the year. It's holiday season. I feel like the weekend rules go out the window and you're allowed a holiday party-ish thing every single night, right? I think that's just science. Yeah. Oh, you guys course. are going to a Christmas party? Is that what's going on tonight? What's going on tonight? What are you guys doing? I don't doing? know. Just a, yeah. Oh, just you two? Yeah. Just you two, huh? Just going to a well, party. <laughs> is there a movie going to be shown at this party? There might be a movie is that's going to be shown. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Obviously, that's happening I tonight. I if never you get to go to premieres. I don't even want to hear it. Enjoy yourself. I'm, yeah, I'm so excited. To um, if you guys want to know our first reactions to Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, tonight is the night. There are a few of us going to the premiere, and we will share our thoughts immediately after it ends. And then just keep an eye on the Collider Video YouTube channel and Collider.com all through the week, because we're going to have so much content over there. And uh, Roka, you are yeah. manning the... What, 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 I am, are you okay? just changed the calendar to say, Roka, you're hosting, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> Thank Not you, Thad. Thank you, Thad. All right, let's get into topic number one today. Of course, it's Monday, it. so it's our weekend box office free. <laughs> Cap. Look at the charts here. We have Jumanji, the next level, topping expectations and making $60.1 million. Then it's Frozen 2 with $19.2 million, followed by Knives Out, which is still holding strong with $9.3 million. And then, oh no, poor Richard Jewell and Black Christmas didn't have the best opening weekends. Richard Jewell made $5 million and Black Christmas made $4.4 million. Where to begin here? I guess it's, it's probably Jumanji. Yeah. So... I had a feeling that Jumanji was going to do pretty well opening week, and I thought it was definitely going to top the first film, which I think it made $36 million yeah. opening weekend, or at least for the three-day Christmas weekend that it came out. But, I mean, $60 million is significantly higher than what I said. I said $45 million. Yeah, I mean, this was fantastic, because obviously uh, people enjoyed that first movie so much. It leaves such a great feeling a lot of people's memories so coming back to see it again why not uh it's a great film for the whole family right you may you can pick some of the story stuff maybe some of the humor might not work for you overall but it's still a good christmas movie for the time it's coming out and it hasn't been tainted like some of star wars stuff or people you know where it has like a division within the fandom people just know what they're getting it's the rock it's kevin hart it's jack black it's karen gillen they just want to go and enjoy themselves and i think a lot of people go went now because they're saying they're going to go next weekend to star wars so they're going to go and front load this thing. We'll see mm. if it has the legs, but overall, I'm incredibly happy for how well it's done. Uh, and uh, I guess this means we'll get a third one, certainly. That would be a bad F word to apply to Jumanji's run, front Which, load. Oh, front load, uh, right. Because that's that is that is my next question mm. for you guys is one of the big things with the last movie is that, you know, $36 million was a solid way to start, but what really made it a box office phenomenon was its legs. I mean, that movie came above, I think, 900 million worldwide. That's a significant total. Yeah. Do you think that this has any shot of doing that or are we gonna see it front loaded? Um, I think it's obviously like, there's no question it's taking a massive hit next weekend, but I wouldn't be surprised if people are coming out of this happy and telling their friends and family, go see this, it's a great Christmas movie, to see it still do okay in its third weekend. You know, hold on a little bit that way, but there's not, like, it's not, to, next weekend's gonna be a bummer for Jumanji, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I would, yeah. you could be surprised, but I just don't see it happening because- I wonder. Everybody, not everybody, but, you go and see Star Wars opening weekend, right? That's what you do, so you don't get spoiled, so you can be a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And and then maybe if you missed Jumanji this weekend, maybe go catch that for, for Christmas break. That I think could work mm -hmm. in its favor is that people are heading into the holidays. And it's interesting because we've seen this year be a real 
just disaster for a lot of IP. So mm. it's, it's interesting that this one continues to click for people, even though it's now a sequel of an IP reboot. So one of my favorite parts of the Jumanji junket that wasn't the bungee jumping is I did get to sit down with two of the producers and you guys know my box office brain. So I got to just sit there. <laughs> I asked them like a whole mm. bunch of box office questions and just the idea of willingly going up against Star Wars again. And I, they just really emphasize the importance of having the success of the first movie and then making Jumanji a December thing. Thing, yeah. and how that actually really helps versus let's say trying to make more money in the summer and having viewers need to kind of like reorient to mm -hmm. make Jumanji in their minds a summer movie. I think that definitely came in handy. But one thing I do wonder for this weekend with Jumanji is like, kind of like spill over in a sense. Like what about people who want to see Star Wars this weekend? They want to go see a movie and they can't get tickets or they walk mm -hmm. up to the theater last sure. minute and it's sold out. Like what, what is the next sure. option for them? Yeah, I mean, it's that's probably yeah. Jumanji. Oh yeah. But there's also the, the converse aspect of that is how many theaters will ultimately be taken away from Jumanji yeah. because mm -hmm. they need more auditoriums to sell more Star Wars tickets. It depends on yeah. how, like how much of a force Star Wars ultimately ends up being this time around, which is kind of a, I feel like an interesting question mark in its own right right yeah, now. I think that's, that's the number one thing because the thing that helped to that first movie, you know, in being at the first chunk and when they were like, as I said, they were just happy to come in second to Star <laughs> Wars. That's what they said over and over again. To, to For them now, what helped them get to the 900 million was the divisive reception to Last Jedi. So if this one comes out and is divisive as well, mm -hmm. then I think we're looking at a whole nother situation here for Jumanji. This could be once again, another wave they ride of people just going in to enjoy the movie because they don't want to go back and see Star Wars over and over again. Or some people, it leaves a bad taste in their mouth. So they're going to go see Jumanji and this will push it over a billion. So I think it all depends on how good for Force Awakens uh, is received or not received by the fans. So it's dangerous to have Thad manning the uh, live chat today because I'm getting some comments here. Oh. First, first uh, a reasonable one. Jay Scott Farrell is saying, saving my money for 1917 and Star Wars. Louis E. De La Pena said, I saw Jumanji Friday. It's not as good as the previous one, but I left entertained. And then Death Star Kitty. Oh, no, wait. All right, I'll read Death Star. No, yeah, that is the one. Death Star Kitty goes, I want to see cats, but I've never done drugs. So I'm seeing Star Wars instead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know, whatever, whatever works. <laughs> for you. I think some of us are seeing cats this week also. So there's going to be some form of review up on the channel at some point. Oh yeah. Uh, let's talk about the flip side of the box office because we also had two other wide releases hit theaters, Richard Jewell and Black Christmas. Neither performed very well. And you know, it's not like I thought that either one was going to blow away the box office, but my mentality was Clint Eastwood movies get butts in seats. I yeah, mean, look yeah. at the, I heard no buzz for the mule last year and it made, what was it like 17 million or something yeah, yeah, opening yeah. weekend. I thought Richard Jewell was in such good position to actually make money. And then we also haven't seen a wide release horror movie in a while. It's Christmas right around the corner. I thought black Christmas was at least going to make 10 million. Neither came anywhere close to those numbers. For me, it's the Eastwood factor that's very surprising. I didn't feel like um, that sort of tangible buzz on Black Christmas. I feel like if I walked out on the street and said, you know, Billy on the street style, like, did you know there was a Black Christmas remake? A, a good amount of people would be like, what? Yeah. Um, but Eastwood is always a steady factor. He's like, nobody, like everyone knows him. Mm -hmm. His name does mm -hmm. tend to get a certain amount of butts in those seats, as you say. It's like almost you assume there's this this guaranteed ticket threshold with him directing, and that that one really really surprised me, especially because it's kind of timely and like there is a lot of conversation around it. I had my threshold at the fifteen seventeen to Paris line, which I thought that yeah. was not a very good movie at all, but mm. that still made 12.5 million. And that's right. what I thought Richard Jewell was gonna hit. I'm incredible. Look, first of all, I'd sign up for Haley on the street any day of the week <laughs> on Fuse, please make that happen. But <laughs> I, uh, I just see her just screaming at people and running would be perfect. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm very upset with what happened with Richard Jewell personally. I'm, I think this is a fantastic film. I think it's getting unfairly vilified in the press for like a few seconds of a film about a, an intimation that a person who already knows another person flirts with this other person and gets information on this other person and they're making a massive deal. Owen Gleiberman wrote this whole variety article and started with, off with Eastwood's political beliefs. And this really bothers me. If we're starting to judge artists by their political beliefs and not letting the film stand on its own and then interpreting it a certain way so to taint audiences from going to see a movie, I think this is dangerous. I think this is the uphill battle. People are trying to say that 
uh, um, Richard Jewell is standing in for Trump and that he's going after the FBI and he's going after the, the, me, the, the media as a fake news going after this person. And like, none of that is in the movie. None of that is in the movie. You have to make yourself see it to see it in the movie. And I think though, all these articles about these media and all these media people writing all these articles are unfair when three quarters of the media would sleep with anybody to get a story to boost their career. Ooh, wow. I'm just my personal Inaccurate. opinion. I just, I just yeah, I am very upset about that stuff because it's like it's it's intimated that they already know each other it's intimated that they had flirt they were flirting and then some information exchange she doesn't come out bad he comes out bad in that exchange so to me overall i just think it's an unfair accusation towards this film and there's some wonderful performances from hauser from kathy bates from rockwell that are getting lost in the mix and it is eastwood's best movie since letters are from iwo jima and should not be doing a box office that's closer to midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. I think it's so unfair, and it's ironic that the media has turned on the movie like they turned on Richard Jewell when they accused him of being the bomber. So I, I just think it's wrong all around. My personal opinion. You'd be mad at me if you want. I just don't like it. All right, all right. Extremely hot take. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying. I, w I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't quite ready for that. Oh. And I, w I would chime in on that more if I was a little more well-read on all the details. I, obviously, I've seen many of the headlines. You have read a couple. Movie. No, I saw the movie. Okay. I read a couple of the articles, right. but like I don't know the nitty-gritty of, of all the accusations and things going around right now, so right, I don't want right. to comment on something no, like and that. I, and, and I respect that her editor defended her and said, like, there's no evidence of this or whatever, but they don't portray her as a bad person. They portray her as an unusual, unique woman who goes and gets what she wants and on her terms. Not really using the best methods, though. Well, yeah. we all have our methods that we all use to get to where we want to get to. That's she, life. She says a couple of very inflammatory things in the movie. But then, t but then the arc happens with her, too, towards the end of the movie. So, all right, all right. Like everything else. So do you think know. that some of the controversy in this particular case, because there's been other movies with controversy around them this year, and all that talk winds up boosting the box office a little in this yeah. case, do you think it truly took away from it yeah i think so i think so because you look at the mule and it got 17 million right and you're surprised that the mule and this is a richard jewel story so i am surprised that people turned on it as quickly and i think that it's the accusations and the negativity uh, in a way that when they're accusing uh like when they're attacking facts of a movie that can affect a movie's awards possibilities that can affect a movie's box office so those are the things that i i, I do think about. that the awards talk is is oh, close to over yeah, for this one yeah. yeah i mean usually you know awards obviously aren't dependent on box office but it does help a movie's award season narrative to say that it came out and it did really well yeah. and that's not the case with this one one thing that i do think Think was a factor for Richard Jewell is it just so happens in the last couple of weeks we've had a bunch of adult oriented films that have done very well movies geared towards older audiences I mean you look at the list you've got something like Knives Out that's still cruising along quite yeah. well we just had uh, Queen and Slim it had a very strong opening and it's also holding on a beautiful day in the neighborhood dark waters Having that many films like that going at that audience at the same time of year is very unusual, and I don't believe we had the same circumstances for The Mule last year. That's a fair point, actually, true. And if I can say one last thing, this is Olivia Wilde. She did Booksmart. She is a, you know, this is a woman on the rise. Would she take on a role that would put this person, like, I just, all of it around, I just do not understand the, the that, you know, that this argument at all. And you're probably right, the context of when it was released, there's more, um, of that audience, there's more options for that audience to go see other things that doesn't have controversy and go enjoy themselves. So yeah. All right, let's loop back in uh, Black Christmas here. So mm -hmm. I think Haley, you made a very good point. I think I think that it just wasn't promoted very heavily. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a couple of billboards here in LA, but I didn't really hear all that much buzz about it. And it's you know, it's a it's a remake of a classic. Usually when that happens, we're talking mm -hmm. about it and we're covering it like crazy. Feels like this thing just kind of, you know, popped up out of nowhere in a way. And I know it was a very quick turnaround time for for green lighting it and then releasing it, but I think the reviews were were maybe the killer in this situation. I think that maybe just the idea of getting a Christmas themed horror movie could have done well this time of year, especially for folks who maybe roll up to the theater. They're like, I don't know what I want to see. I want to see a movie tonight. I'm into horror movies. I'm going to go for that because usually horror movies do have this baseline that you could hit that or come in above it. But I do think some some negativity about the quality of the movie might have uh, might have kept it from achieving that. I think that's a certainly could be a factor, but I also think that like people have to have heard of the movie to let the negativity influence them. And I just like 
If you look at the difference between, so obviously this is the, the tippy top of like the most they're going to do, but if you look at the, the sort of rollout of publicity they did for Halloween, that's an example mm. of like what you do with a legacy slasher title that you think is going to be a massive hit, right? That was yeah. everywhere. It was at freaking Comic-Con. It was, you know, it was a very big publicity rollout. I don't know that I ever once saw a TV spot or trailer or anything for Black Christmas on any of my platforms or TV or radio or anything, you know? Um, so I do think that that's just like, on a, on a very practical level, I don't think a lot of people really even heard about it. And then to have on top of that somewhat mixed reviews. Yeah. I don't recall seeing a single TV spot now that you say it. Mm -hmm. Even even with the trailers, like, I'm not one to actively avoid trailers. If somehow you didn't get your trailer in front of my eyes, I feel like that's, <laughs> that's a bad yeah. sign for a marketing push. Yeah, and I, I agree with you, Haley. I, and Perry, I didn't see uh, TV spots or trailers for this thing. I, other than working here, obviously, you know, you'd see things drop and Collider covering it. But all I saw were like those bus stop posts. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> those I saw, those, those posters, I would see those driving around LA, but not, into, not in a massive way and um I, it's a weird combo because sometimes like the nun comes out no real stars in it makes a crap ton of money You're like why did this catch on why didn't black christmas come? do do and i don't know you guys as, as, as co-hosts of collider witching hour do horror films do well in december that's what i'd like to know is there a historical they can they can, they can? traditionally okay. or okay. at least in most recent years yeah. no okay i don't think we've had a big uh, horror hit in December in quite a few years. Right. Or well, at least nothing that comes to the top of my mind right now. I think it's probably a combo of a lot of things, right? It's like, uh, do I see it around me? The bad reviews, it got a D plus cinema score. There's not a lot of stars. Ooh, yeah, and, yeah, that's, I mean, that, that pretty much yeah. ends its run <laughs> right. in my mind to me also. And there are not a lot of main cast stars that you would know necessarily right off the bat. So a combo of all those things uh, probably sank it. Um, and the, the remake had, come out what like 13 years earlier i think the 2006 2005? or 2005 something like that okay. so it's like okay but it made more money than the remake at least on opening weekend at least you can tout that good 3.7 million was the black christmas remake from back then so oh wow yeah um i don't, I don't know adjusted for inflation i don't know what thinking about the nun though i feel like part of the reason why that did really well is i I feel like it chapter one reshaped that time of year as far as releases go for horror. So it made that a hot spot. On top of that, it had the benefit of coming in the Conjuring film franchise, which isn't something that we've taken a break from. It's something right. that's been going strong. And also it's the image of the nun. I mean, I think it was the same thing with Pennywise, maybe to a lesser degree, when all of a sudden the it campaign was starting to roll out. Yeah. There was something about a scary clown that caught your eye I and made you pay attention. And I think that The Nun has had, you know, a similar effect, obviously not hitting the same box office, but it's still made a good deal. And I think that that's, that's what it is. Yeah. That's, that's the hook that you, that you, uh, that you need when you don't have maybe the biggest names in the world drawing you in and making it a priority. Yeah. Cause there were some great concepts presented in the movie. They just didn't a hundred percent, you know, Perry and I reviewed it. They just didn't a hundred percent nail it. And almost when I was finished out with our review, Perry, I almost thought to myself, I'd like to write a remake of this, mm. like down the road. Uh, just because I think the concepts of what she presented, April Wolf, the screenwriter, and Sophie DeKal, the director, I, I, I think those could totally be explored within the framework of this particular film. And so I'm just like, oh, someone's got to get this thing 100% right because there's a lot to mine here. So. Yeah. Uh. I'm not gonna get into it. did a pretty good job getting it 100% right the first time. Well, the first time, yeah. exactly. I'm, I'm, I adore the original. The original. Yeah, yeah. Spectacular. Um, here's Hossier. actually one comment on the matter from MK Songbird, who wrote Black Christmas was the only ad I saw on Hulu while watching Castle Rock this season. Got mm. so sick of the trailer, honestly. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a fair point. That's you funny. know, them advertising it on Hulu makes a whole ton of sense. Well, that's interesting mm. because that was one of the platforms where I was surprised I didn't see a trailer. Huh. So I wonder like why I wasn't flagged oh, for that particular trailer. I would be so curious yeah. to dig into that kind Show of stuff. Show me your algorithm. Hulu. Yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's roll into our second topic here. It's a big one. It is the breaking news story of the morning. We have a brand new Top Gun Maverick trailer. Yeah, this trailer is something else, but I'm not letting uh, myself, Haley. Sorry, you got to take a <laughs> take a seat for a minute because Roka, oh, my pleasure. Roka is bursting at the seams Let's right now, it. eager Let's to talk it. about this. All right, Roka, did you like it? Let's talk about <laughs> it. It was fantastic. I love the fact that we got back into the '80s vibe of the first one. That was so 
awesome. And they slow down the old score, you know, to get that feeling of you walking back into Top Gun. Of course, they did great stuff with the stuff with the jets, with the planes. That was incredible. But then you get this voiceover presenting you with Maverick, like the things he's done are legendary. You're going to be trained by one of the best fighter pilots. And then you have this cute little interaction where he's like, I didn't expect to be asked back. And homie's like, those are orders, Maverick. And so he's still <laughs> always the rebel, right? But then you get some great shots of Miles Teller as Goose's son. He's got that little old school mustache that Anthony Edwards had in the original 1986 film. And then you've got, uh, oh God, who's the other guy? Glenn Powell, who's in there as well. So you know they're going to go at it, kind of a pseudo Iceman, maybe. And then there's the funeral, right? The funeral's a big deal. People guessing who it is. I do believe it's Iceman. Jennifer Connelly is at that funeral in a black dress. So is she Iceman's wife? Is she Iceman's sister? I don't know, but we see a romantic situation between her and Maverick. Clearly, it didn't work out with uh, uh, with the original uh, actress from 1986. It didn't work out with Charlie. That's That was her call sign. So we move forward. I, I'm excited, and it feels like he's taking on the Tom Skerritt role from the first one. So overall, great second trailer. Completely different from the first trailer. Didn't give you any plot other than they's training him for some mission, and I like that we have a little bit of mystery from this. All right, that's it. I have a question for you, Rocha. Yeah. I have never seen you wear those glasses, those sunglasses yeah. in your life. Do you just keep them in case something Top Gun drops so the that you can time, have them? For the first trailer, Perry, I mean, uh, uh, Riley and I did the reaction. Uh, we went and got aviator glasses oh, okay, at the okay. mall and then <laughs> came back to do it. You know, you know, Haley, what do you think of this? Did it do anything for you? Gosh, I left I left my aviators at home <laughs> <laughs> along with my uh, my epic rant about the trailer. Um, no, I, I, don't, I don't share your depth of love and affection for it, so I'm mostly just thrilled to have observed that in... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks um it looks really good like i i mean visually yeah. and that's sort of you know one of his things as a filmmaker just because is like he makes gorgeous movies yeah. um and i don't being someone who doesn't like connect to the story as much as you do mostly my takeaway was like wow the jet stuff looks awesome yeah. <laughs> because it looks really like the i'm excited to see what he does with that action i love what he did with the action of Tron Legacy, which is very, mm. you know, vehicle oriented in its own way. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited to see what he does with some jets. I think I kind of echo what you say. I really like Top Gun. I grew up watching it a lot, but I wouldn't say that a second Top Gun movie was something that I was dying to see. This trailer might have upped my hype for it a little bit because the visuals are just so striking. And yes, I would expect that from him, but paired with how this trailer is cut, this is like an especially, and it looks like a very, I mean, maybe this is just my editor brain kicking in, but this looks like an especially complicated trailer to cut. Yeah. Just so, so like you up the intensities as the, uh, the visuals up in intensity, but also just so everything makes sense. Also, I want to see this thing on the big screen. Yep. So I think with the way it looks and the way it was cut, it really got me this morning. Well, and go back and watch the original Top Gun trailer. They basically follow the same pattern. When, and I remember because I'm younger or older than you two, I was in that theater when that first trailer came out. It's the mm. Jets that sold us, right? It was the Jets. And after that film came out, the signing up for the Navy, the number of people that signed it just grew in insane numbers because they all thought they're going to be Maverick, right? So that it wasn't. It was not just Tom Cruise's performance. It was the visuals of the dog fighting that they do with those jets. Just seeing him split those two jets in this trailer, you're just like, oh my God. So it makes the logical sense. The jets have always, or the, the planes have always been the focus of Top Gun and what really sold it overall. Let's do a little early box office predicting mm. here because, you know, we've seen a whole bunch of franchises do reboots, uh, give out sequels so many years after the last movie came yeah. out. Do you think that this could be a different case where with that June release, it's bound to pop at the box office or could we wind up seeing it in a similar position as certain other movies we've seen this uh, year? I'm scared. I want it to make okay. 100 million, but I think it may be 40. Opening weekend? Yeah, maybe, I think I maybe 40, think is, 40 yeah. to 60 is possible. I think Wouldn't that even, be good? I think even that might be good. Yeah. I'm not confident. I don't know. I This year was very like, a, yeah. a Terminator really floored me in a way that I think people might be over nostalgia in a way that's mm -hmm. going to take studios a couple years to catch up with. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm very intrigued. That said, 
Mission Impossible just keeps getting bigger and bigger. People love seeing Tom Cruise in yeah. action because we know that he's one of the few who's doing it more intensely and better than any mm -hmm. actor out there in terms of his commitment to a stunt in a scene. I think that holds an appeal. He's one of the last like r true movie stars on the market in the old fashioned sense. Mm -hmm. um, that said, true movie stars less and less have an ability to actually get people into seats. So I'm very, um, it's like, I can't see, I can't, the signs aren't there. No, I can't yeah. read the tea leaves. I don't know. You said you said two things that kind of, you know, made me super concerned, but also made me have a little more faith in it. And I do think it's the fact that that Tom Cruise is having still a ton of success with the Mission franchise. And I think he is, you know, I'm not going to say whenever he's in a movie, it's a guaranteed winner because look at The Mummy. But in the case of The Mummy, I still think that that did kind of well like not well you know when you compare the fact that they wanted to start a franchise and how much they spent on that movie but when you look at how much it made that weekend and the quality of that movie i feel like it is a sign that he still got people to give it a shot yeah. so if top gun maverick comes out and if it is very well received maybe those two things could align kind of like they do in the mission franchise mm. and we could be looking at maybe like that 50 60 million dollar start that you said i hope so i mean you look at american made versus the mummy american made is a much better film yet it didn't do as well box office wise as uh, the mummy uh, him and franchises that's the key right and you guys talk about this terminator is an interesting comparison but um tom has been still doing it for all these years whereas linda took some time off so i mm -hmm. think if linda had been doing it for years and years and years on a franchise i mm -hmm. think the box office might have been a little bit better so the fact that tom is still in our purview still we're still seeing him do stuff um but makes arnold him connected. has been and the yeah. trailer yeah, no, true, sold him true. as a major part of the movie that's a fair point i mean but you know then again those other films were so bad that's true yeah, so that, you know. <laughs> and just to get in the other side this is the thing that has me most concerned that it's going to take studios a long time to catch up with the fact that the value of nostalgia is fading because I mean, it's not even 2020. There's movies that are based on the nostalgia idea that are coming out in 2021. Yeah. And if what if that whole sector just starts to tank, they're gonna be dealing with the repercussions of that for years to come. So yeah. that is wildly alarming to me. And it could be the case with this, but again, I really do believe that this could do well if it's good. But just to look at the release calendar in June, Wonder Woman hits theaters June 5th. That's gonna still be cruising along by the end of the month. Candyman is June 12th. Then uh, June 19th, we have Soul and then Top Gun Maverick. Here's the big one though opens up against In the Heights, which just had a massive trailer debut to the point that people are predicting that that could be one of the biggest smash hits of 2020. I believe it. I don't, we'll see. Oh, okay. I do. Yeah, so do I. I absolutely do. I, the only, you know, musicals don't always work, mm -hmm. but sometimes they sure do. And sure. John Chu is coming off of the success of Crazy Rich Asians and tapping into an audience that was really hungry to see themselves represented in that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Obviously, I don't need to talk about how much I love Lynn manuel Miranda again. Like, we all know <laughs> he's the best. Uh, I think that could be huge. But yep. um, do I think it's a direct threat to Top Gun? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think there probably is more audience crossover than might be immediately obvious. Mm. But I also think that there are plenty on both sides of that equation who maybe don't have interest in seeing the other. It'll yeah. be fun. All right, it's gonna be an interesting one yeah. to track. Before we move on, I have one uh, live chat question from, from uh, Luis E. De La Pena who wants to know, if you could have a pilot call sign, what would it be? Come on. Oh, don't say the outlaw. I mean, what else can I say? You can say it. Outlaw. Pick something else. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if there is anything else. What about you, Haley? I don't know. I'm H Halian. I don't know. <laughs> oh, wow. Alien? Halian? That was, yeah. oh, okay. that was really creative. I like that. Right. Thanks. <laughs> I'll take the diesel for John Riggins from the four. The diesel would be good. <laughs> I don't know why the first word that comes to mind is Dewey. Maybe I could be the Dude. deputy as like a, deputy. a little nod to Dewey. I'll take I that. Like that. All right. And then you get a little scream reference in there. I'm good with that. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to some promos. We have so much content coming your way on the Collider Video YouTube channel. If you haven't gone over to the Collider Interview channel recently, there's so much good stuff there, like Ladies Night with Karen Gillan. And we have so much Star Wars content if you want interviews with the cast of the film. But right now, we gotta tell you about another Star Wars-related thing coming to the channel later today. Rule of two, here's a promo. 
Hey guys, Riley here, and let me tell you about Rule of Two. You looking for a Star Wars fix? Well, Rule of Two is that show. It drops down Collider Video's main YouTube channel, as well as on Podcast One's Jedi Council feed. So go over there, subscribe, share it with your friends. It's hosted by myself and Mark Fernandez. We talk everything in the Star Wars universe with a lot of deep dives and a lot of conversations that go all in. You know what to do. Subscribe, join us there, and rise. All right, guys, the time has come. It's time to talk about Power Rangers. I feel like I've been inundated with Power Ranger tweets all weekend, and I'm okay with it because the second this news broke, I've just been dying to talk about it in case you need a little catch up here. So this report comes from THR, and they're saying that a Power Rangers reboot is in the works from the end of the effing world director, Jonathan Entwistle. Here's the big thing, though. The script promises to return the property to its 1990s charms by having the main characters travel through time back to the 1990s before trying to get back to the present. They they had me. They had me until time travel. Oh. Until time travel. <laughs> and until we just had that conversation before about the failure of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. They are basically doing a one-two nostalgia punch. Just make a modern, really good Power Rangers movie right. and don't complicate it with a time travel narrative. I mean, part of the... I know that part of the reason... Uh, I know that Power Rangers, as in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, where my love for this series came to be, like, it had creatures and individuals from space. Like, things... To, like giant kaiju things like would spring up from the ground. I know it had, you know, crazy sci-fi elements, but I feel like time travel just comes with like so much messy storytelling stuff when the real, when, one of the biggest reasons why I loved this franchise so much is that, you know, it's a group of friends. It's a group of kids that feel like you and me, and they were lucky enough to get a power coin and put on a suit and fight for good. I'm afraid that the time travel narrative is going to take away from that. And it's just going to get too complicated and convoluted and it's going to sink the franchise on the big screen again. But I can't say no to Power Rangers, so I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it has to be that way. I, like, I think you can very easily be like, if you want to, I don't know, the guy, I don't, look, you can just be like, oops, <laughs> I touched a rock and I'm in the 90s. How'd that happen? Whoa, I'm not in the 90s anymore. It really doesn't have to be that complicated when you're dealing with space stuff. You can be like, oops, we walked through a portal to the 90s and then we're back and then we're dealing with the type of time travel where you don't have fallout from your decisions, no butterfly effect. And it's like, it, it's up to you as the writer how complicated you want your time travel to be. Uh, Terminator in the original film never really contended with the implications of all their time travel antics. It's part of why the whole freaking franchise is so confusing. But, um, mm -hmm. It, but it worked within the contents of those original films. I feel like the general movie going public looks at it differently, though. Yeah. Also, because ever since Terminator came out, we've seen so many time travel movies where it gets into the nitty gritty and the complications. And we have a whole bunch of like non theatrical content out there that, you know, explores theories and stuff. I just feel like we're in a different place as far as how we view time travel movies, where you're automatically applying the rules from movies that are now considered classics. And it's almost like, in, I mean, I'm not going to say that there's no creative solution to that, but you need to have that in mind when you're writing that kind of narrative because you almost naturally can't help those thoughts to come up. That's it. It's interesting. I, time travel isn't where I got caught up on this one. The fact that they're even doing another one is where I got caught up with this one. But the idea of the time travel actually doesn't bother me because I think it's a way of touching base with the people who fell in love with it in the 90s and then coming right back out. Outlander has been doing so well for so long oh, on television, yeah. and that is all time travel. Her jumping literally centuries into is different. It, do they literally touch a rock? Is that yes, where my brain yeah, yeah. pulled I think that from? That's where it was. Yeah. <laughs> so she goes into like you know uh, uh, you know the colonial times, and then back out uh, to her current present state. And so the, I think you can do it if you create it in the context. That if you create the parameters very firmly within the world you're presenting on screen. I actually like this, and maybe they're just going back to touch base with the older generation. And maybe you'll get little cameos or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they. To kind of show them what they need to do and they can take kind of like elements of that and bring it into the present. So it's a way of kind of being meta without being overtly meta. And I think it's, I think it works. All right. 
I, I have faith in this one better I, I don't than the wanna, I don't want to sound doom and gloom, but I'm so, like, everyone, I'm not going to lie. Everyone knows I'm very sensitive about mm. the last movie that came out. I really liked it, and I wanted to see this franchise have new life. So, you know, when you make a risky move like that, I get nervous, and especially when I bring back the conversation we were just having about the, the waning value of nostalgia on the big screen. Yes. Leaning on it so heavily does make me nervous. I mean, the, the story idea of maybe have them going back to the 90s yeah. and using that opportunity to bring in cameos and teach from the original generation that does excite me a little i'm always going to be rooting for this franchise and have a little bit of faith just because i love this the original tv series particularly mighty morphin so so much but mm -hmm. how how can i not be nervous after what happened last time i was gonna say my question to you is do you think do you think this should even be happening to be okay so just to give you a sense yeah. of how i would react had the story details not been in here i wouldn't be negative at all okay i really all right. i really do think that again the idea of unsuspecting kids coming upon you know this like space tech so to speak that gives them the ability to fight for good i think there's just something inherently appealing about that and there's something about just like the group of them and the visual of the power rangers that's always going to be a winner in cinematic form but then you add, you know, some of the story details and it's, it, you know, it's a challenge, especially when, you know, we're talking about Terminator where Genesis had come out so soon before this last mm. one, this movie isn't going to have that much space between it, between this new one and the last one. And, you know, I know for a fact that not everybody out there, you know, Haley, you said you didn't, did you say you didn't love the movie? Or I think no, I was I reading so strongly against it in, uh, in the dot com article, but yeah. I know for a fact that a lot of people out there don't like the movie as much as I do. And yeah. this is the kind of movie that is going to require a big budget and it's going to require the wide movie going public to come to accept it or it's not going to be a success. So, you know, when you have that to contend with all so there's just a whole bunch of red flags here and I so desperately want this to succeed. Mm, as I mean, for me, like as someone who, yeah, I didn't really like the, I didn't hate it. I didn't remember it, frankly. Mm. I tried to watch it again and halfway through, I was like, I've seen this movie. Uh, so that's where I was at with it. I, I, I'm excited to see them try again because the last one didn't work for me. So I'd rather see something new and different than the same. I, I What I do like about the time travel is that color was used differently in the 90s style was different in the 90s i don't right the 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 use of color and style in the new film didn't work for me at all mm -hmm. it didn't feel like power rangers it didn't look like it to me it, it looked yeah, it uh, something very different to me and it didn't work so i'm i'm hoping that this you know encourages them to embrace the sort of goofy pastels and primary colors of the original and and downgrade the technology a bit and not make it look so mm. sleek and futuristic and, and embrace the aesthetic that I loved when I was watching it. Interesting. Okay, so you wouldn't go the realistic approach or fully realistic. Uh, no, I don't think I would, but I, I think you can go realistic within the context of the 90s. But I, I would personally play it up because it was never a realistic show. <laughs> That's the thing. And I, and I, I think the one realistic thing they need to have is their expectations on this thing. That's, <laughs> oh, that's, well I mean, said. let's be real. I mean, like, look, look and, and, I, and I, I do want to respect because, of course, uh, being friends with Perry and, and, you know, being in contact with people who are massive Power Rangers fans, there is a certain decade or generation of people who grew up and they love this thing. But it's not Transformers level. And so it's like, there's there's like levels of Transformers, Voltron, uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Those are all right around the same time, uh, give or take a few years. So you go, okay, what's the fandom level, right? I don't think Power Rangers is anywhere near the Transformers fan level. Did you have Transformers strong... sheets? Yes. Okay, me too. So I'm kiss. saying we're right on the same <laughs> level. <laughs> what I'm but I'm saying, it's, 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 it def those movies for whatever you like, they made four and a half billion dollars. I don't think that's going to happen with Power Rangers. So you got to be realistic in your expectations. Of this. I think the focus is make a damn good movie that respects the original, uh, uh, that why people love the original, and then advances it in a way that's interesting and fun and new and vibrant and don't expect to make $500 million. But you just might. You just never yeah. know. But I just think you have to be realistic about your approach. No, I, I think you're, we more. talked about this on a recent show, like stop putting enormous budgets on films that don't yes. necessarily yeah. have the potential to return them. Right. Yeah. I mean, I also... I'm curious to see when the cast comes together. That's I feel like it's true. also a very difficult thing to picture until, you know, 
like you get a sense of the directorial style that's going to be applied. You get a sense of like the cast and how that's going to look. I think one of the biggest things, just like it was with the last movie, is when mm-hmm. we get our first look at the suits again, how that differs from, you know, Mighty Morphin, let's say, to the last movie. So yeah. I'm eager to hear more about this. I'm always rooting for Power Rangers, but I do I'm, really, not, I'm just nervous. I like Jonathan <laughs> Entwistle's work on... Um, end of the effing world yeah i think it's really a special show and if he gets either of those kids to be in this movie that would be a huge one especially jessica barden because she's phenomenal that's a good call Mm. i wouldn't mind that all right before we leave you we have uh we have some live chat questions here all right let's go with i'm just gonna roll down this list actually mk songbird says what are your favorite movies where there is a twist that completely changes the way you view a film on its second viewing? So maybe if you say anything in the last like year or two, let's mm. not spoil okay. anything. So, but if it, if it's a super old movie, then you know, Unbreak- spoil away. Unbreakable will always yeah. be the one for me. Unbreakable, even more so than The Sixth Sense or any of these other films. Unbreakable. That twist at the end is just like what the, and then everything, <laughs> and then rewatching the film a second time is even more fun when you put it through that prism of the superhero prism. What you got, Haley? That's a very good one. Yeah. Um, I would say in keeping with my my brand, I do love revisiting Suspiria, given what happens, and I won't give anything away, obviously, but hmm. that movie did play differently for me a second time. Also recent would be Get Out. It's yes. just like, I feel like that's the recent hallmark of, of that kind of filmmaking, where it's a completely different movie the second time around. I couldn't agree with both of those more i'll Mm. also throw in and i'll actually not spoil what it is in this situation because i think that not enough people have seen this movie but the invitation i think that when i saw where that ended and then i went back and rewatched it there are so many like little details and nuances that i further appreciated and completely changed the viewing experience in in a good way I, this isn't a film, but the entire season of Watchmen, we just mm. watch. The more you know as you go through episodes, the more you see in the episodes that already hmm. passed. Okay. I, I know you said not to mention anything, but I would say Parasite. The twist in Parasite. Mm. I'm not giving anything away. The twist in Parasite, when you go back and see it again, there's so much more weight being given to the interactions that occur up until that twist. So. That's a good one. I have to do a rewatch. You know what I did finally do a mm. rewatch? Oh, I can't believe I didn't tell everybody what I watched for the first time at the top of the show. But first, I did a rewatch of Joker. Yeah. And I feel like seeing his whole journey play through the movie and then going back and applying everything that I knew from my first watch to the second one. I it's still it's like not my favorite movie of the year and I still think <laughs> there are some story weak spots, but I definitely appreciated that character journey a lot more the mm. second time around. But the movie that I finally watched that I promised that I would watch over the weekend is you know what it is, because we were talking about it. Do were we? Alita. Well, Alita, I watched Battle it. Angel, yeah, finally. Yeah. I finally watched it. And I liked it. Okay. I liked it. It was it, it's good. It's yeah. good enough. I it's think, enough. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of points where I was completely floored by the visuals where I thought it looked like particularly where Alita's alone. And it's mm. like that fish out of water type stuff happening where she's realizing, you know, what oranges are and like what her body does and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But then there are other moments where all I could see is the the green screen tech. And I still had the same problem that I did the when I saw the footage at what was it? New York Comic Con or something. Mm. The like the ones that are just like faces. Out of just something about that didn't sit well with me. Yeah, like the guy that was in Midway. I forget his name now. The guy in Deadpool. Uh, Ed, Ed Screen. Ed mm-hmm. Screen's, I, don't, oh, I thought yeah, his yeah. didn't work anywhere near as good as Rose Salazar's did, which were really good. And shout out to her, man. because she's, so she's so good. She's so good. She's so good. And it's interesting because she's doing that. And if you saw that Amazon Prime show she did that was all like oh, animated um, over the undead or yeah, something uh, like that. No, no, no. What's un, un. I wanted to say unsane, but that's not right. <laughs> undone. 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 Yes. Uh, I covered that at San Diego oh, Comic-Con really? and okay. I watched a bunch of the episodes yep. and I still need to finish the first season, but it like, that is one heck of a four. I've never yeah. seen anything done like that, that before. She can show her talent through that medium and bo- and the Alita medium, uh, which are, you know, con- unconventional ways to show your abilities. It's, it speaks volumes about her as an, as an actress. I was I was very impressed. I had a lot of fun with it. I mm. had a lot of fun with the motorball stuff, which is what I yeah. expected. That's, oh, that that's like a, a story detail that definitely speaks to my, you know, sports loving sensibilities. Right. So I wasn't surprised that I was taken by that. One of the things that, and I don't know why I should be wowed by this because of uh, his strong performance in other things, but I feel like Christoph Waltz was like the coolest thing ever. And then all of a sudden he had a couple things that didn't really pan out. He's so good in this. Mm-hmm. Like his initial like warmth and chemistry with Alita is is really, it's like palpable and it's something special. And yeah. I feel like 
it came through his performance a lot that I was so pulled into it and so invested in them. So like big applause to him. I thought he was great. Um, hey, Roka, you want a horror question? <laughs> sure, let's do it. And Chris Robinson is asking, which second features from a horror director this year have been your favorite? The Lighthouse, Ready or Not, Brightburn, Midsommar, Child's Play, Us, Pet Cemetery. Midsommar and Us. I had a feeling you would say that. Yeah. Oh, I would say Ready or Not and Us, both of those. Oh, Ready or Not is also fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Those two are the ones that stick out. Midsommar, I'm still processing that. Movie. It's been <laughs> um, three months and I'm still processing I'll process it for the rest of my life yeah. and that's why I love it. <laughs> I, I think I would put Us at the top of the list just because in, as far as my rankings for 2019 goes, it is above everything else. And I might go Pet Cemetery next. That's still pretty high on my list too. I don't care if you don't like it. I love it. Um, <laughs> but I think that one is a, is a good sign for for those guys that they have mm. a bright future ahead of them all right how about uncut gems jay scott for real is asking who would you like the safty brothers to cast as the lead of their next film i love this question i'd like to see them work with an upcoming leading lady like florence Pugh. Mm -hmm. mm. that'd be really good mm. i i having just watched and been totally rocked by uncut gems would like to see julia fox have yes. a leading role she's, she's so good she's so she's good so, so good I, yeah uncut gems might be very much in my top tier of the year right now. oh it sure is and i've watched yeah. it <laughs> watched it too many times <laughs> it's so good that's also i think that's also another one that has really good repeat watch mm -hmm. value where you know when you see what howard's up to the entire time and how he carries himself and you go and you rewatch it it's just i don't know you see certain things that you might have missed the first time around. We need to discuss this. I'm very surprised you like it. It's such an unpleasant watching experience. I, but it's like, it, it, you know what? It kind of reminds me a little of Unsane in a sense, but with yeah. a different kind of like anxiety inducing feel. But like the whole, it's just like, this was me the whole time I was watching that movie. Like, no. Yeah, like, exactly. No. Why would you do No. But like, even while I was doing that and while I'm looking at him and I'm like, you're making one piss poor decision after the next, <laughs> I'm still rooting for him to win. I know. Why? That's the charm of Sandler. That's why you cast him. Oh, he's so good. It's um, really special. Who's the actress in Queen and Slim? I like to see uh, her. Jodie Turner Smith. I like to see her work with There you go. Films. That okay. would be a nice combo, I think, uh, for another next film. Because we brought her up earlier in the show, and I'd like to see her stay in the industry longer. I'd say Linda Hamilton. <laughs> oh, oh, hell, hell yeah. yeah. I'm dead right. serious here. Right. I just, I feel like she's so capable of having, like, not tied to Terminator, some sort of, like, resurgence yes. performance where we really see her, I don't know, deliver high quality yeah. work. Yeah. I'm really into that. I, I think that all of these were really good. I'm so yeah. impressed with our panel. <laughs> all right. I don't think there's a better note to end this show. And I'm very impressed by you guys today and always. Thank Roka you. Haley, thank you so much for all your hard work. Same to you, Adam, and you, Thad, in the live chat. To everybody out there watching this show, do not leave it without liking and sharing it. And also, there is only one place to go after you're done with Collider Movie Talk. It's on over to Collider Live. And then tune back in because that guy's hosting tomorrow morning. 9 a.m. PT. See you then.